for tips and tricks this is the one we're doing presenting in 2021. First of all who am I? My name is Alec Giles I'm a structures consultant at Grey Tech in the UK and I'm also an Autodesk expert elite. I originally did a mechanical design apprenticeship about 30 odd years ago. I spent about 10 years designing machinery then I became the CAD manager for the company I was working in looking after training or support for all the CAD users. I became a member of Grey Tech in February 2010, so I've now spent 11 years focusing solely on advanced steel, <coughs> providing training, support and consultancy. Why should Grey Tech be your business partner for your software? We believe we're unique in being able to offer products and services covering the entire life cycle of your products. And we like to split that into four areas. We have Create, first of all, where you create your designs using Autodesk products and those are enhanced using the Grey Tech Power Packs which add extra functionality and productivity tools. Then we have Simulate. Once you've got your basic design made you need to test if that will work in the real world so you can use the Grey Tech state of the art market leading uh, analysis software to analyse that design and make sure it's going to really work. Once you've finished your design you have to manufacture it so we move into Grey Tech Fabricate where we have tools there and software and services that will manage your entire workshop and that manages everything from the materials flow through the workshop sending the right NC files to the right machine to scheduling the people to do the right tasks at the right times and finally all of that produces a lot of data so we have Grey Tech Manage which has uh, products there open tree to control all your work in progress data uh, manages it, controls access, makes sure everybody's on the right version of the right file at the right time and controls all of that for you until you go and pass it on to a third party data environment. So we can help you throughout the entire product life cycle for your service. Uh, this webinar forms one of many that we do and if you go to the Grey Tech Content Centre there's a link there um, then you'll find a list of all the previous webinars we've done and there's well over 50 on that list. They're split into uh, three categories, AEC, manufacturing or structures. There's well over 50 just on the structures group, plenty more on the other two groups. And you can watch any of the previous webinars on demand. If you download the handout from the handout section of the webinar, you, these links will be live. So highly recommend you take a good look at the content centers and review the many, many useful webinars we've done in the past as well, if you haven't already seen them. This webinar could take a, a few days to be added onto that content centre after we complete this webinar, but this will be recorded and added as well in due course. We also do a lot more content than just webinars. So we've mentioned that we've got the content centre, there's over 50 hours worth of training there uh, for advanced steel plus lots of other stuff. But we also do blogs and again there's an advanced steel blog as well as other blogs for other products and on the Great Tech UK site. And we have over a hundred blogs on that, many of which are tips, or most of which are tips and tricks for using advanced steel, getting more out of it. And if you're a Grey Tech UK user, uh, customer, then you also have access to Grey Tech Advantage. And you, on that Grey Tech Advantage, you can watch all the previous presentations and classes from previous BIM Up conferences. Grey Tech to our annual BIM Up conference with over 200 classes each year so there's plenty more content there and we also have the user days from the last two years on there so you can watch anything you might have missed from those user days and finally if you have support with the Great Tech UK then you should also be entitled to have the power pack for advanced steel if you're in, not in the UK check with your whoever you when you're in your subscription with whether you're entitled to the power pack or not um, Great Tech power pack so if you're new in your subscription with Great Tech then the power pack adds lots of extra productivity tools and advanced features on top of what Autodesk provides you. So today's webinar is general tips and tricks and we're going to look at a number of different topics. So the first one is to make the most of your foundation plans. There may be some hidden features there you're not aware of. Then 
what happens if your file crashes or your machine crashes while you're in the middle of your workflow? How do you get your file back without losing any work? If you want to add a different type of section to the railing joints or macros, popular request is to add half round square edge bar. We can do that, I'll show you how to do that. Then you've got uh, adding new cladding sections because the range in the system is obviously really just fairly limited example. Um, you need to add your own suppliers. And some little modeling tips for how to cut through just one side of an SHS or how to make a reduced diameter on the end of a bar. So we'll go through those one at a time and hopefully you'll find something useful for each of you. So the first topic on that list is making the most of your foundation plans. Well, when you do your foundation drawing, your overall plan of the building, marking out where all the beams and things go, we recommend you use the style stanchion layout all. That's the one out of the box on the UK build that's designed for that overall foundation plan. It dimensions the grid, it shows the base plates and the columns and not much else and the concrete. But did you know if you have a concrete slab it will automatically dimension or label the top of concrete so that uses the elevation that's been set in your model so if you have the level symbols in the model and you've changed your global datum you should always model at zero 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 so if it's at 200 feet above sea level you want to put 30 40 60 meters in there as a um, datum level you put that in your level symbol in the model and the top of concrete label will respect that same as all other levels in the project will and it will automatically label the top of concrete for all concrete slabs also the main purpose of the foundation plan is to identify where the base plates go so with your base plates have you ever tried entering a name for the joint name in your base plate joints when you do that you may have seen this name box all joints have a name box like this you've probably not wondered what it's for but in this case if you put that in on the base plate base type a base type b or whatever then that will be automatically labeled on your stanchion layout so you can see where type a goes where type b goes where type c goes and so on it will label each one so not a lot of people use these names but that can be a really useful feature you have your enlarged detail for each base plate type and then the overall plan tells them exactly where each one goes straightforward and easy but if you don't have the name in there you don't get a label if you put the name in there you get the label simple as that so that was very straightforward easy hope that was helpful uh, the next one what to do if you have a crash in your mid work and this one we've comes up every now and then with support um, people try and use various methods of getting their file back and they lose the drawings or this don't have everything first rule is do not use the drawing recovery manager if you have a crash next time you fire up advanced deal this will come up automatically and it lists lots of different drawings that you've been working on recently and if you choose the one you're currently working on it might list various versions of it the idea is you can double click on one of those and it will recover that file and make that your active file don't do that it might seem like a good idea but if you do that it always makes a brand new file it does not recover a previous file so it always counts as a new file if I clicked on even if I clicked on May 1 DWG it will become May 1 recover DWG not May 1 so it's got the wrong name even if I was to then do a save as and save it as May 1 DWG it wasn't the original file and if it's not the original file you will never be able to link it to any existing documents so all those drawings that you're in the middle of editing you'll never be able to link the new model to those and you've overwritten the old model so you're now in big trouble so whatever you do don't touch it because you'll never be able to recover all your drawings and all your if you have saved lists or NC files or whatever they're not such a big deal but uh, most of the drawings you'll never be able to link them back to the new file if you use the drawing recovery manager so although that might seem like a good idea give it a miss what you need to do instead is to find the auto saves manually so where are the auto saves gone well normally unless you've edited it when you first install the auto saves for AutoCAD are set to go to your system temp folder and that is somewhere hidden under your user profile on the C drive so where on earth is the system temp folder 
it's really confusing to remember. But what you can do, if you open Windows Explorer, and in the path bar here, where it tells you where you're looking, just simply type in this code, percent temp percent, and it will jump immediately to the system temp folder. Wherever it may be, it goes to that folder. That's usually where the autosaves go. If you can't see a lot of SV$ files, the autosaves have the extension SV$. If you can't see those, then go to AutoCAD options and double check where it's got set in the automatic save file location. This one's got something cryptic written in here. So I would copy that and put that into the path bar in the Windows Explorer and that will take me to the right path. So you might have changed it. Some people change it so all your autosaves go to a nice easy place on their C drive or whatever. So if it's not in the system temp, it will be in whatever path this says here instead. Once you get to that path, your files will be, like I say, have the SV$ extension. But as you can see, it's always got this gobbledygook on the end. So you'll have the start of it will be much the same as your file name that you'll expect to be working on, May Run or Mayo Balcony or whatever, and then it'll have all this gobbledygook on the end. It's kind of a time date stamp, but it's not reliable in that way. But it's in order to make sure there's never two files with the same name, so it's all nonsense. So what, what you need to do is look at the date here. So you find the date here and the time. There may be more than one with different gobbledygook numbers on the end. So you look at the end of different MA ones, whatever many there might be, find the one with the most recent date and time, and that's the best file you've got for your backup or to emergency autosave. So that's where you can get your autosave. Alternatively to autosave, you might want to use the backup. So this is different. The backup is always living next to your model. There you go, July 3 and I've got July 3 back. July 1B and July 1 or July 1 and I've got July 1 back. Every time you save, the previous save becomes the backup. So if I saved at 10 o'clock and then I save again at 5 past 10, the 10 o'clock file becomes the backup. And then I save again at quarter past 10, the 10 o'clock file is deleted, the 5 past 10 file becomes the backup and the quarter past 10 becomes a DWG. So it's always your previous save is the backup. And that might be more recent than the autosave. So compare the date of time with the latest backup with the autosave. And whichever one's the latest is your most current recovery file. Because no matter what you've set the autosave period to in AutoCAD, you might set it 10 minutes, you might set it 20 minutes, it will not save every 10 or 20 minutes. It has some strange logic. The intervals between the autosaves will not be that recent. So you might say, well, how come I've got my autosave set to 20 minutes, but the latest autosave is an hour and a half ago? It's just the way it is. I can't really explain it any better than that. It's just a funny algorithm on how it decides when to save. So your backup may well be more recent. Once you've found either the backup or the SV$, dollar, the autosave, and you've decided which one you want to use or try, then to recover it you do this. You take your current DWG file, may one DWG or project.bdwg, and you rename it. You're probably going to change the extension to say BAK1 or something else like that. But rename it in some way. Do not delete it. You might still yet have to go back to it if it's still the best available. So don't delete it, but rename it instead. And then you find your chosen recovery file and you rename that, changing the extension to DWG. So if it says SV$, dollar, or if it says May 1, gobbledygook, numbers, SV$, dollar, rename it back to the original name, so just May 1, DWG, or instead of May 1 back, it'll be May 1, DWG. So you're going to need the file extensions showing in your Explorer to do this. It's horrible when they're not showing, you can't tell what's going on. Make sure that the recovery file is in the original location. So if it's the SV$, dollar, after you've renamed it, you have to move it to the original home of your DWG file as well. The backup will already be in the right path. And then you open that new DWG file, the one you've just made into a DWG. You can open that using the file open inside Advanced Steel. And it will come up showing you whatever state the model's in. And any derived documents should 
still be linked. So any drawings you had, if you had 200 drawings linked to that model when it crashed, you should still have 200 drawings linked to it when you open that new recovery file. It may be though that if you you might have them linked, you, know, you should have them linked, but sometimes it still doesn't quite get them because it depends whether you save those drawings more recently than the last that the auto save. So if you had 100 drawings made when you did the save, but then you created another 50 and it crashed, the last 50 won't be linked because you hadn't got an auto save since the or backup since the crash. So you, you can use this command on the output ribbon in the document managers panel go to this command with a plus on it which is register documents to model. Select that and it will open up like a file open window it right in the correct path it will be in the right details folder inside your project folder select everything in that folder there's no point in picking and choosing just do control A to select all of them and then say open and that will find any files in that folder that aren't linked and link them up to your model if it can. If you follow that procedure that will keep all your drawings still available, still live. You might go into the status saying unknown, in which case you need to do a force update on them, but they should still be linked to your model and you can recover them and move forward. If you did any other procedure, you will not be able to recover those drawings and you have to start all your drawings all over again. There's no two ways about it. I can't do anything about that. If you've done the, the drawing recovery manager, you're doomed. So follow this procedure and you should be safe. We have tested it. Okay, next topic is adding sections to railing. So you may have noticed some commands or macros in Advanced Steel only allow you to use a limited range of sections. For example, um, portal frame, you can't use things like a tube for a column. You can only use certain types of section. For stairs, you can only use certain types of section for the stringers. You can't use sigma beams or something for a stringer. It wouldn't make sense. And it's the same with railings, you can only use certain sections, you can't use absolutely anything in the system. But uh, quite a few, quite often we get asked well, about half round bar or something, I need to use one of those for my rail. Well this is how you can add new sections to something like the railing macro. There you go, so looking in the list here we've only got certain sections, half rounds and things are not in that list. That's all controlled by a, a database table. So. If you ever do the training with us, then we'll tell you all about the management tools. And one of the tools in there is table editor. And we usually advise you don't touch the tables or ever edit anything in a database directly unless you're under some kind of guidance because you can trash the system if you break the wrong entries in the wrong place in the databases. This is one example where you are gonna to have to go into the table editor and edit those databases. So it uses this table here, joints, GUI, allowed sections. It's all about this table. So what have we got to do? Well, like we said, you go to Management Tools and you select Table Editor. Then you navigate through to Aster Rules, Joint Scurry Allowed Sections. You can use the filter at the bottom. Once you've got this open, you can just tick the filter box and type GUI and it'll come up with just showing the couple of tables so easy to find the right one. You have to, have to add a brand new line at the bottom of the table for your new section you want to allow. But what do you type in that new line? because it's what's it going on about. Well, you can see there's five columns. What do they mean? Well, the key number here is just a counting number. It really makes no difference what goes in that column, but you have to put any number you like in that's not already used. So the bottom number might be 927. You just put 928, whatever the next number is, as long as it's not already used. The joint name. Now, the joint name is a special bit of text. You can type anything you like, but it won't work unless you type in a recognized name. And this is one of the secrets. You have to know the right name to put in that box. I'll tell you what they are in a minute. So this is the name of the joint. And then joint control, oh well, for the standard railing inside the system, then the name for that joint is railing new. Not just railing, we'll notice it's railing new. And you have to get case sensitive, so you have to use the capital R, the capital N as well. The joint control is the same for which part of it. Are you saying oh, I want to add a new section for the posts, new sections for the middle rails, new section for the top rail or what? <coughs> there are a number of different controls available in each joint. So you have to have exactly the right name again to put in the joint control. Now, what names are available? Like I say, if I just 
just go back a second for the standard railing if you're adding it to the standard built-in railing in advanced steel then the joint name is railing new and these are the, the possible controls so you could add whatever you want half round posts if you wanted to so it's got post kick rail you can see there you got kick rail top handrail middle handrail or grab rail so you can put any of those in here and you can add new types of section to it if you're using the grey tech power pack you might be aware that you've got lots and lots of much more powerful railing commands in the grey tech power pack then here's the list of all the different controls you might want or that are available so depending on which type of railing whether you're doing the standard railing double post key clamps or the wall railing the before the three bars there's the joint name grey tech wall railing grey tech standard railing or whatever and then inside the great extender railing you got post control top rail control middle rail kick rail and so on so before the three bars goes in the joint name after the three bars goes in the joint control so like saying again download this uh, handout from the handout section on the webinar interface and you can have these links will be live and you'll have this information available to you so you choose what you want to add to so let's say for example we're going to add half round bar to the standard railing in the power pack so you've got the new line 927 joint name is grey tech standard railing joint control is top rail control then you get to the last two columns so allowed section type what's that all about we can do it by generic shape so you can say all i-beams or all flat bar or whatever but those have basically been covered already so the other choice is to do a certain range just a specific named type of beam and for doing that is the option in this list will be section class it's actually um, a drop down so you'll only have two choices you don't type it in you pick off a list section class or section shape you always want to do section class for adding your own and now the last column allowed section this gets a bit more cryptic you need to know exactly what to put in under allowed section this is where people who struggle often make the mistake you have to know what the correct type name text is for your type of section what do I mean what's that on about type name text to find out the type name text you have to jump to a different table so you might want to do this actually at the start to find it out before you begin you have to find the table ask the profiles profile master table there you go ask the profiles profile master table and you find in there the section you want and that will be under run name so it's probably easiest if you click on the heading run name it'll sort <coughs> excuse me it'll sort them into order scroll down it's a very long table you'll have hundreds and hundreds of lines on it but scroll down and find the one you want this is what you see in the interface when you're picking that thing so I'm looking for half round solid or half round square edge probably half round square edge bar so I've got to look in this to find half round square edge that's what I read when I'm picking it inside the vast steel in the run name column and then I look across to see what's it say in the type name column it might even be worth doing a copy so put your cursor in there select all and say copy because this might vary I mean look at that how thin I don't know how thin it is but the type name text is completely different so sometimes you just add USR in front sometimes it's completely different you need to be really precise and choose exactly what it says here so you need to know that and that's that is what you put in under the allowed section here so like say user USR space half round square edge case sensitive critical you get the spaces right and everything else so if you do that you will then be a, once you've entered that line into here update defaults as always or restart advanced deal and then you'll be able to go into that and choose that new section type within that control so the top hand rail I can now have half round these half rounds half round feather edge half round solid and half round square edge those are added in as part of the power pack so if you haven't got the power pack don't bother looking for them unless you've made them yourself but they are a popular request so we've added those into the power pack of those ranges of bars so that's how to add new things to the railing and actually the same gist applies to stair macro and other joints you can look down 
in the GUI allowance sections table to see what else is in there. If there's something in there, different types of purling, different things for stringers or whatever, then you can add your own shapes to it. Next topic is adding new cladding to advanced steel. So there's cladding beams in advanced steel are limited and they Autodesk have got no hope of maintaining a library of every supplier around the world, maintaining all their fancy shapes for all sorts of dozens of suppliers in each country around the world. It'd be a full time job for several staff and they're not interested in doing that. So this is whatever's in the system is an example, basically, and it's kind of up to you to make sure you got the right ones you need to use in the system. So you can add cladding. You may be aware that the cladding sections are basically just fancy beams. So the first thing you do is you create your user section for your desired cladding shape. So here we go. I've invented a cladding shape here. And it's my, my range is called Alex panels and it's a 600 wide panel. So Alex 600W. I recommend if you're doing your own cladding sections, I've got a full webinar on adding your own cladding. But uh, you look on the content center, you can see that full webinar. Just as a summary, I recommend you have your standard at contour. It's just a plain flat shape because that makes it fast. That's what you'll see then on the drawings. Most of the drawings, you'll have just the two lines for a flat panel for your cladding. And then your exact section is the one with the fully complicated shape, which you can switch on if you really need to uh, here and there, but you probably don't really need it most of the time. But once you've created your user section, that's only half the job. That's the easy bit. And there's plenty of FAQs on uh, autodesk.com and videos on how to create user sections. And like I say, I've got a full webinar on this, which also covers it. But to use that within the cladding joint, there's a cladding macro that will automatically place the cladding with the overlap, correct overlaps and so on. You need to, again, go to the table editor and add extra information to some tables in the database. Specifically, first of all, you need to go to Rule Cladding Profile Classes and add the whole range to that. And then you go to Rule Cladding Profiles Info and you add your specific section size into there with the right dimensions. Like, I'm not going to go into any more depth here because I've already previously done a full webinar on adding cladding and how to use the macros and so on. So look back on the Content Center and you'll find that full information. But you have to add the class to the bottom of the classes, so that'd be the Alex panels as our whole range. And then after add the specific size, Alex panels 600W, and tell it how wide that is and so on on the claim profiles info table. Once you've added those two critical lines, then that new section size will be available in the cladding joint for you. So next tip sometimes you get the odd question like this if you're cutting one face of a RHS or SHS or whatever sometimes people need to do this need to cut a box or a hole in one side of the box section well you can do it you should use the contours that are on the features tab so it'll be one of these th six buttons not that one actually so it'll be five depending on the shape you want polygon circle or rectangle now it does say um, it's based on the UCS, those contour commands. So wherever your UCS is positioned, the contour will actually jump to that position. So if UCS is vertical, or Z vertical, it's going to go here, cut vertically. But the UCS, the, sorry, the um, feature will actually be on the system line of the part. So it's on the system line of the beam and it cuts all the way through. But I didn't want to cut all the way through. I want to cut just one side. Well, in the dialog box for the feature properties, uh, the contour processing, you've got the boundary option here. So at the moment that cut is not limited, it's got no boundaries, so it's infinite up, infinite down. So it's going to cut through both sides. Side 1 happens to be above and side 2 is below. Or positive Z, negative Z, perhaps that's the better way of putting it. So if it's not ticked, it's going to go infinite through the whole object. It won't go through any other objects, but it's going to go infinite through that object no matter how long that might be. What you want to do to cut just one side, you tick the box to say limit this direction. 
and then you can put the value in the box there so he's ticked side two so it's saying go down only go down 20 mil so go down 20 mil and then stop and if that doesn't reach the face the RHS it won't go through the bottom face like that so 20, that's more than 20 mil to reach that bottom edge so it's not cutting the bottom side anymore you could put zero in there I mean it would definitely not cut but remember this comes up on the system line so if the system line is on the corner then it's all going to be one side or the other so maybe down would be through fresh air and it would all go in upwards you can also put negative numbers in this box to move the bottom boundary not 20 mil down but 20 mil up so minus 20 would move the bottom boundary 20 mil up and then cut from there all the way upwards so just play with those boundaries you can also play with negative numbers to manipulate it so you only cut one side of your box or one side of your tube or uh, whatever if anyone the cut not to go all the way through final tip for today keeping these webinars a bit shorter so we're not taking too much time of out of your day final tip for today is again a, a, a request we get from time to time on support how do I turn down the end of a bar if I want a different diameter on the end of my rod or something like that if you try to use a circular contour it will just take away the whole end of the rod so that's no good um, so or make a hole in the if it's smaller than the diameter what you need to do is create kind of an arch or a semicircle shape like shown here you could have a square for the top you don't have to follow the exact shape there you can cut fresh air it doesn't matter but the bot the inside shape is what counts the circle there and the horizontal bottoms at least reach the edge of the part you can go outside the edge like say if you want to cutting any shape you like but you have to draw that arch shape then you use polygon contour and you pick that polyline and you set a boundary so you set the depth there so he set it at 80 so he's only cutting 80 mil along the beam whichever one it is side one or side two and then you mirror that the same notch or you do the same thing again the other half to mirror cut the way the bottom half you can't do the whole circle in one go it's quite straightforward to do it but you can't do it all in one go and you can't it's not like a revolve in something like inventor you can't just draw two circles and cut them all the way along it doesn't work like that so this shape could be a big rectangle with just a small semicircle in it so you're going to cut the one beam it's going to cut along then you mirror it to the other half the bottom half you can use that same principle for any shape you like but uh, that's how you reduce the end of a beam to a different size and that pops up on the forums or in support every now and then so we thought that'd be a handy one so there's a number of tips for you today like I say we're trying not to go too long uh, drag these webinars on forever so they're quite short and sweet these days uh, but I hope you found something there useful if you have a crash you can now recover your file without having to do a start again on all your drawings you can add your specific sections to railing joints if you want to use a new section that's not in there you can create your own claddings and use the cladding macro for that and you can do these little modeling tips as well so some nice ideas there hopefully you can find that beneficial and that's it for today I'll wait for a little while now um, if you want have any questions you can type them into the user interface in the chat window or in the questions window on the go to webinar and I'll do my best to answer them